Dala. So today we are going to be talking and deepening our understanding on totems and the different kind of totem that they are. I've been having several um, messages and comments on the videos that I've made so far on animal totem. And it seems that some of you are still having some difficulty understanding um, what a totem is and how it functions. The totem is really not based on your own personal uh, uh, on your own personal take of uh, philosophy of choice of lifestyle or choice or diet. Okay, I think I've mentioned in other uh, videos on animal totem that um, in order to have a better idea of what the totem is going to be about, you have to observe the animal in his, in his or her natural state, in his natural environment. A carnivorous animal is not going to be mixed, meshing well with someone who's a vegetarian. Um, and that is not my own personal my own personal take that is just what nature is showing us and teaching us and anyone who takes the time to observe that will see that in nature animal do uh, eat each other uh, there is a chain of um, of life because there is a biodiversity each uh, animal each entity living entity living being is playing a specific role and this is why the disappearance of some species can create major major imbalances the overpopulation of some other species can also create major imbalances but at the same time it is in this type of projection that some of you have expressed to me that you know for example the lion will go around and kill all of the animal on his territory that is your own projection. When you observe nature in a normal environment where that hasn't been uh, disrupted by either chemical toxicities by human beings or that where the animal is not, has not been um, uh, programmed or domesticated, we observe that there is a certain balance. Um, I've mentioned before that a lion may be called to protect um, animals on his territory because um, he wouldn't want um, the prey to be depleted. And, uh, an animal also usually does not eat when he's not hungry. If a serpent, an anaconda, for example, uh, kills a prey, it's going to be taking days and days to digest that prey. And while it's dige digesting, sorry, the serpent actually becomes vulnerable because this is where the time where you can get killed. You can get attacked by all kind of other predators. So there is a certain balance in nature. Things are not really made, you know, by uh, uh, by um, coincidence or by chance. Okay, this biodiversity has a way of functioning. It's been like that for billions of years, and it will certainly be like that if human beings were to be extinct. Now. In terms of the uh, animal totem, I've had several discussions and I think people are very focalized on the animal totem because this is the most popular, this is what everybody talks about, this is what you can find on the internet online and there's so many blogs, so many information that it is really, really um, easy to get a minimum of information on this topic and kind of grasp the idea, kind of grasp the concept if we don't have personal experience about it. Now, animal totems are not the only totems in existence. Um, totems can be found in any kingdom that, um, um, that exists. So I've started with the animal kingdom, but there's also, and this is what we were going to be talking about in this video, the mineral kingdom, uh, mineral totems, and as well as plant totems. So the first thing is that we'll start with the mineral totems simply because uh, the premise uh, or the principle, the foundation of establishing or having a totem is based on an understanding, a symbiotic relationship between a human being and an entity part of nature. So in the case of animal totem, we were talking about animals and human beings having a symbiotic relationship, a give and take. So you're not just taking or you're not just giving, you're receiving as well. And um, it goes both ways. It's not a relationship of a master and slave. It is not a relationship of a pet and its owner. Okay. It is a, um, almost a partnership relationship. Okay. 
both uh, both uh, parties are um, equally involved in the uh, relationship. And it is a relationship that takes years, sometimes generation to build. So it's not something that you wake up today and you and you just want to dive into and um, you think you will you'll know everything in a couple of hours. This is something that may take generations, as I've mentioned. Now, in terms of the mineral kingdom, um, it is well known. Anyone who works with crystals know that crystals have a mind of their own. Okay, you can uh, start working with a crystal. The crystals finish with you, disappear, go to someone else. Um, you know how many people have had crystals that they couldn't find anymore? That they searched the house um, up and down without being able to find them. Um, the same way you can find a crystal on the street, you can find a crystal anywhere in your environment. Sometimes just by looking um, in the environment that you are, whether it is a forest, whatever, wherever it is that you are, there are minerals all around you. Yes, of course, we do love the crystals and the way they look and the most popular that are being exchanged in everywhere the places, but uh, crystals are mineral essentially, and rocks do have the same properties. Um, so in certain places you have rocks that are deemed to be uh, sacred. Um, and sometimes because of the sanctity and the sacredness and the energy that's present there, um, the relationship that they have established with the uh, native people that are in the environment, it um, may be seem difficult for people not within the culture to understand. People may even want to try to Christianize those places by just building, putting a cross on top of it. Um, but essentially, those are very specific um, totems, uh, mineral totems that exist that certain guardians are there to protect. Certain guardians are there to uh, decide who can come in, who can not, and to maintain the relationship and to pass on the knowledge about that relationship um, forth so that it is I kept going. And that's again, that's a relationship that that being passed on for, you know, generation to generations, especially the more ancient the place, the more ancient the tribe, you will find this type of understanding being passed on. And you have also other places where are that are also deemed sacred. And essentially it is a relationship between the place, the mineral and the people. Uh, here, for example, you can see that you have um, a mountain with a lot of uh, rocks and, 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 and granites all over the place. But then you can also see that there are a few houses there. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a mountain in northern Cameroon um, uh, related to the sacred feminine. And that you see that people are there. They are also uh, respecting the, sac the sanctity and the sacredness of the place. And, the and they have a specific relationship with the kind of mineral around them in their environment. So it really comes down to that. I think I, I don't stress it enough that um, uh, most of the wisdom and understanding that we get, we get it from our relationship with nature. You know, the creator... Uh, created all the different things and gave us the ability to observe, the ability to communicate with those different kingdoms and definitely the ability to create bridges to help each other. And this is what is at the foundation, at the core of the totemic system. And uh, people who are, uh, I will say, um, uh, luckily enough or have uh, already for service are really interested with maintaining and learning more and developing that, those kind of relationships. And then, of course, uh, crystals can be found anywhere, and they can be found in the dry land or also in the forest, and they're very much everywhere. And so it is um, because they are everywhere, because uh, indigenous people took the time to actually live in harmony with nature, learn about nature, learn about the environment, that it was obvious and inevitable that they will develop a relationship with uh, the mineral kingdom, just that as well that you'll develop a relationship with the animal kingdom. And of course, this leads us to uh, plant totem. And here I want to make this, um, this, most of this video is going to be with plant totem because I've seen that there's a lot of misconception or maybe there's a lot of different perceptions perspective and per uh, perception about plants um, and somehow uh, some people who uh, some people kind of establish some people kind of establish a form of hierarchy where they will say, you know, the life of a human being is the most important, then the life of an animal is uh, secondary more important, and then the plant. And by doing this, they're kind of devaluating what a plant is. They kind of, um, uh, you know, 
uh, glancing over the nature and the wisdom and the capacity of a plant. Uh, of course, it is no normal and simply natural that as a human being, you will value uh, the life of another human being, just like an animal who will value the life of its own species, its own offspring over those of um, other species. That's only natural. One cannot ask um, uh, less or more than that. Um, however, for the other life form on this planet, um, I will not establish a form of hierarchy. Uh, saying that you don't eat animals because you don't want them to suffer, uh, but yet you are saying that you eat plants because plants do not suffer, there is a problem there. Uh, and there is a problem there that is based on a lack of understanding of what a plant is. Um, and I will recommend for those who have trouble understanding this um, to spend some time with a, um, an herbalist, an herbalist who is living in nature, a herbalist that hasn't necessarily stepped foot in the city because he is living actually where his plants are in the environment and that where uh, he, uh, he is or she is of, a, of service. And I'm saying this because when you start working with plants, when you're on a deep level, when you start understanding plants, you understand that they have emotions, you understand that they have a spirit, you understand that they have also all of the senses that we do have. They have a sense of smell, they have a sense also of energy, they can hear sound, they can communicate with each other, they have uh, chemistry, they secrete, they have secretions to defend themselves. Um, and so they are intelligent, as intelligent as an animal. They also have properties, they have virtues, and this is also why, you know, um, herbalists or people who are working with plants will always ask the plant if the plant wants to be, wants to help them. They will always ask the tree if they may take a piece of the trunk. They will always speak and communicate with the plant itself because the plant is a human being. Um, if you do also additional research or watch um, documentaries, you will learn that a plant um, fruits or a plant leaves are not there to be eaten by other people or to be eaten by other animals. Yes, to a certain extent, it does. Uh, the plant does provide uh, food for other animals, but there is an extent to that. The plant knows that if an, all of the animal came and ate all of its leaf, uh, it would not be able to do what it does especially depending on um, the environment where the plant is. And this is where we've seen documentaries or experimentation where if you if you um, do something that's hostile to your plant, like take all of the flowers before the time they have time to pollinate, or take all of the leaves before they have the time to renew themselves in a climate or in an environment that is very harsh, then this plant is going to transform. This plant is going to have a reaction to that and a reaction that is going to be aggressive. We've seen plants that they didn't have thorn uh, start growing thorn to uh, prevent people from, or, um, uh, or um, animals even, from eating their fruits or eating their leaves. Uh, some other plant we literally pro produce some uh, toxic chemicals to prevent um, being eaten or being attacked. So the plant clearly has a mind on its own. The plant clearly can sense when it is in danger and really can sense when it wants to preserve itself. And this leads also to the totem. Totem, once again, is an established relationship between uh, a living entity and human beings. Um, and um, here, people have developed certain affinities, specific affinities with certain plants, um, and where the plant and you become one. The plant and you merge together at a deeper spiritual level. You are able to know where to find the plant when you need to, uh, you are able to know what the plant needs to take care of it. And I think this is really, really important, especially if you have indoors plant. I talk about this a little bit in my uh, sacred space uh, program, which you can find the information in the description box, where I basically discuss um, what you need to do, the basic things you need to do, and maybe um, a perspective to take in consideration if you want to have indoors plants. And you have to understand that those plants are cut off from the normal environment and the biodiversity because they are in a pot. They no longer are uh, linked to the ground where they can communicate and be with all the other plants. Um, they are now, you know, um, confined to 
the space within your home. So when you take that in consideration, you know that you have to take special care of that plant, especially if you do want to maybe connect better with the plant kingdom. So when someone tells me that they are eating, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables because they do not want to hurt animals, I, um, I wondered if they understand that the plant is also a living being and a living being of its own rights. So we eat because we have to eat in order to survive. We eat because it is the natural process of biodiversity. Um, we eat because it is also a role that we have to play within the chain uh, of biodiversity. Uh, certain plants cannot uh, proliferate too much, otherwise they will even uh, make the water toxic or take too much oxygen in the water, which will c could, uh, kill fishes and things like that. So there's an order of things. This is not something where people in modern time just wake up one day and say, hey, you know what, let's, let's just do this, do this kind of thing. This is something that was established thousands and thousands of years, even before human beings even appeared on the face of the earth. The, the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the animal kingdom were already balancing each other. They were already keeping a certain balance in terms of uh, avoiding overpopulation and maintaining certain species. And evolution also played into that in terms of the species that could adapt when the weather changes and so forth and so on. So plants are not this kind of uh, empty... Uh, marginal thing that sometimes I perceive people uh, think of them. Um, they are even more ancient than animals um, and so they, they have this, this additional knowledge. But I think it has to be seen with that type of sacredness. It has to be understood that way, especially when you do have a plant totem. You're going to be particularly in tune with certain plants. You're going to be particularly uh, sensitive and sensible to those plants, but mostly to all other plants. And then eating does not become a philosophy. Eating becomes part of your understanding of your role in the cycle of life, in biodiversity, in your environment. This is why sometimes I always push people to eat locally. Eat the fruit and the vegetables and the things that are, are growing around you. And eat according to the seasons. Eat according to what is supposed to be available at that time of the year rather than eating things that are being imported or broadband or mass produced just because a new trend is taking off. So um, I think this deeper understanding of plants will come to help you and assist you when you're trying to make lifestyle choices or diet. And of course, this is only one perspective and you are always, always free to do what works best for you. Okay, I've mentioned before someone who has a, a, a an animal totem which is a carnivorous, is not necessarily going to be that much in tune with plants. Um, or someone who has an animal totem that is eating uh, that is a herbivore uh, may not also have that sensitivity towards plants. However, uh, the common ground is that balance must be kept at all time. We don't eat to indulge. We don't eat to, we don't eat or or kill uh, in order to uh, play or in order to entertain ourselves. Uh, we do it to maintain the balance that is already existing in which we are part of. Um, and so there is also this assumption that plants are just there, they're just really nice, and they're just, you know, here for waiting, just waiting for us to eat them or just waiting for us to use them. I've mentioned before that practitioners local practitioners who know the environment, who know the plant they're using it, will always ask permission. Permission can be asked in many different ways through rituals, to just speaking to the plant itself, or through meditations and other forms, depending on the relationship built between the practitioner and the plant. But so you, I just wanted to put this reminder of that certain plants are poisonous. So obviously you're not going to be eating all of the plants. Okay, certain plants are also carnivorous. So plants are not there just being nice. Some of them are eating meat or eating insects. Some of them can trap um, animals as big as rats um, and digest them. So this kind of notion that us, oh, somewhat the plants are 
better and the plants are kind of just with this ideological romanticized um, view of plant. Of course, the majority of the plant are not going to kill you immediately <laughs> or are not going to be um, impacted or trying to attack you. But you have to r remember that they are plants that are strategic in terms of killing, in terms of defending themselves very efficiently, and also in terms of tricking um, other animals in order to eat them. So I hope this segment just brings you a lot, a little bit more information so that you don't necessarily stay focused on the information already being displayed. I think it's a great start to learn about animal totem and to understand that. And, you know, I've, uh, I've received so many messages of people f uh, finding out or searching for the animal totem, whether it is just the uh, uh, animal spirit on different level on different courses or finding out that they have some type of lineage with um, totems in their families. Um, I just hope that this video was kind of like pushing you to broaden a, a bit the spectrum and go beyond what's already available. Just take the time to try to have a, a, a bigger picture understanding in terms of seeing where everything fits and also coming back in basing your perspective on nature. If you look at the jungle, the jungle is not always a happy place. There's a lot happening in the jungle, um, which even a happy place, th that will be a projection, a connotation uh, from our perspective. Okay, the fact that a lion kills to eat, there's nothing negative about that. The fact that the plant will absorb minerals from the soil, there's nothing negative about that. That's just the course of life, the life cycle. Even to go deeper, besides plants, trees are also totems. Trees have also a, such a deeper, deeper relationship with human beings. And this is really one of the areas that, I, that I'm, I've, I've been really fascinated by. Uh, that I've observed so many different things that, defies my, that have defied my mind and my understanding. And just to share with you one thing, we'll talk about the baobab. And I know this is not going to do you justice. I just wanted to give you a little taste because talking about the Baobab will require a whole video or a whole course of its own. But I came to learn so much about the Baobab while I was in Senegal, which is in um, the west coast of Africa, um, uh, closer to Mali and on the shore. Um, and so there, um, the Baobab has been totems uh, related to different castes, to different tribes, um, and it's just a fascinating tree. First of all, just the size of the tree uh, makes you feel mesmerized, makes you feel that you're really a small part of the universe. When you're standing next to a, next to a baobab or you're observing uh, an area full of baobab, you are taking awareness, being more aware of your place in the universe. And secondly, um, the baobab is used or is used by certain tribe as a burial ground. People are buried within the tree. Okay, so just when you think about this symbiotic relationship being where your corpse is being put inside of the tree, where it's going to decompose, where all of the element of your body, your flesh, is going to sink in the soil and the tree is going to feed on it. Your DNA is actually absorbed by the tree, but you become a part of that tree, that tree becomes a part of you. In certain tribe, actually, the it's not just anybody that is being buried within the baobab. Sometimes it is the Creole. Uh, some of the people that are actually uh, of service to the community. And the tree in African culture has deep, deep symbolism. This is where you go and speak. This is where the tree speaks to us. This is where you gain wisdom. This is where you can reflect. This is where you can also um, uh, mesh, quarrel, uh, uh, speak and discuss any disagreements, any conflict and resolve them. So the, the symbolism of the tree itself and here related with the, with the ba baobab give you uh, a, a deep meaning of that symbiotic relationship between men and trees. And in this particular case with the griot, who have been serving the community just like the tree has been serving the community, because the baobab produces fruits, fruits that are called sometimes in French 
um, pain de singe, which is basically uh, monkey's bread. And, and that kind of a fruit uh, is uh, sometimes put into mesh into powder and mixed with water to make a, some type of drink. Uh, sometimes it also can be eaten um, as is. Um, so there's a variety of things that the tree is providing to the community and feeding the community. Now just think about this symbiotic relationship and this person being buried inside of the tree. His DNA or her DNA being becoming part of the tree and then the tree producing fruits that people eat. And of course, you can tell me that, oh, you know, at the genetic level, if you take samples, you're not going to find any specific DNA to linking to a person. However, it is, it is also well known that we do share certain genes with plants and with trees and with um, other living creatures. So this was just food for thoughts. So that when um, someone is presenting a perspective to you, don't limit yourself to what is out there. Seek and try to go a little bit further. Try to know a little bit more. Um, I mean, I've only touched upon animal totems, mineral totems, and uh, plant totems. But there's a lot more out there. So thank you for being with me, and I'll be with you in the next video. Bye-bye. Salalia! <laughs>